Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our meeting. The uh, first item we have on the agenda is the pleasure of meeting. You may stand meet after meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. First item we have is to approve the agenda. Make a motion to approve the agenda as uh, released, printed. Second. It's been moved and second. They would approve the agenda as published. Uh, any further comments from the board? In that case, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 That motion shows. Next, we have public comments. Uh, first on here, Ron Corn to speak to us. Please step forward. Is that what this podium is for? Sure. Yes. All right. My name is Ron Corn. Um, so I'm here to address the board tonight. Um, I'm sure you guys are going to be talking about. I haven't seen the agenda yet. I haven't looked at it. But I'm assuming you guys are going to be talking about school schedules with the whole COVID-19, um, how you guys are going to open, if you're going to open, all that good stuff. So that was my purpose to come in here tonight was to voice my opinion. Um, I, I've got to tell you, I'm upset at the whole COVID-19 thing. It's been politicized. It's, it, is it real? Yes, it's real. There's a virus out there. Is it deadly? No, I hate to say there's nobody died in Bonner County in the last six months or however long it's been here. Boundary County, what, one death in Kootenai County. So the virus is real, I'm not going to argue that, but it is not a threat, and it's not a threat to our children. There's studies out there, everybody says, oh, I fall back on the science. Well, I beg to differ with the science. The science is this, and the science is this, depending on which one you want to read. There's science out there that says how deadly this is, how we should be social distancing, how we should be wearing masks. There's other science out there that says how dangerous it is to wear a mask how bad it is for our kids and the adults to be wearing masks for many reasons. Um, it, it's very upsetting to me. Socially, I don't know where we're headed as a country. I can't change that, but what I can do is try and help change our community. The whole face mask thing, I don't even recognize people in the store anymore because we're all covered up. We can't see each other smile at, at ourselves anymore. It's getting a little bit ridiculous. And to hit, sit there and say that our kids may not be going to school this year or this semester or whatever is being discussed. Um, I saw and I participated in your guys' um, survey, not this recent one, but the last one. I, I, I participated in the recent one, too. But if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was 77% of that people that took that survey said they wanted their kids to go to school. I believe that's the numbers. Um, that includes myself and my family. Um, if there's 77% of the people that want their kids to go to school that don't believe that this is an issue for our kids, a safety matter, a health matter, um, I do believe it is a social matter and obviously an educational matter. Our kids are not learning by doing computer work at home. Mine didn't. Mine had to go to summer school because of that. And I'm telling you right now that if you guys aren't going to allow school to be open for the full five days, I see it may be a shortened schedule as a possibility. I can't have my kids go to school. My kids are either going to go to school or they're going to be homeschooled. That's the bottom line. There is no in between because my kids aren't learning. I can't speak for other kids, but I can speak for my kids. My daughter graduated this year. It was very unfortunate what happened with the whole graduation. Um, I, I have, this is the first meeting I've been to, so I don't know what's going on with the board meetings and all. I'm sure it's a hard decision trying to filter through all the information, again, this side and this side, and, and, and trying to make everybody happy in the world. I know that. Um, but hopefully um, we can keep the majority happy, I guess is what I'm asking. Um, so 
I fly showed up here tonight was to voice my opinion. I hope that you guys will vote on opening the schools, letting our kids get educated as they should. We are putting money to have public schools. I'm not sure where the money is gonna be going. I'm not sure what's gonna happen with um, the levy and everything that was voted on and passed if the schools aren't open. It raises a lot of questions, and to me, it also raises a lot of legal questions as far as what's gonna be happening with that money that we all voted on to be spending in our schools that we're not now spending. What's the deal with our teachers? Are our teachers still getting paid? I, I know, I've talked to a few of them on Facebook. Oh, well, we're still working. It's like, you, you might be working, you might call up that, but you're not teaching our kids. You're sitting in your classroom by yourself or whatever it is that you're doing, looking on the computer, grading work that people have turned in or haven't turned in or whatever's going on. I don't know. I didn't see it. Well, we want to, we appreciate your, your uh, comments. And we're glad you take the time to do it. And I think if you stay through the meeting, I think you'll see what we want to do and which way we're heading. So I think it'd be very valuable. But anyway, thank you very much for your comments. Thank so you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next we have Heather Bergen. <coughs> heard about this last minute, but uh, I came tonight to say that um, closing school is not, it should be an option. Our kids cannot handle that socially. I think that that's inappropriate for them to have those guidelines, masks, six feet apart, don't touch your face. What first grader do you know is not going to stick his finger under his mask and pick his freaking nose? Like, that's what's going to happen. Um, it is, in my opinion, borderline child abuse to put a mask on your child. It restricts your oxygen up to 6%. You are breathing in your own bacteria, which then re-enters your lungs. Um, I will not put a mask on my children. Absolutely not, they won't go to school. Um, if you're smirking at me, that's not very funny. I think you should be paying attention. You're part of the board. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I just think that it's borderline child abuse. You are saying that our immune systems cannot handle this virus. Coronavirus has been around forever. This is just a different strain. What's the flu? The flu mutates every year. If you get a flu shot, good for you. That's awesome. But I don't. And I never have and I don't get the flu. So I'm not getting a coronavirus shot. So if this is going to mutate every year, why are we wearing a mask? I'm not taking the vaccine that's made less than a year. Ever. So, ever. I'll never put it in my kid's body. I feel that... Um, you're saying that our children's immune systems are not strong enough and they are not building to fight this off and you're going to compromise my kids' immune systems? I will not allow that ever. So um, I think that if you make that decision, you're going to lose a lot of people in school, which therefore will defund the teachers because you won't need to have them for as long. And we're going to rise up and I'm going to start a co-op. I'm going to teach these kids. I'm going to get other parents to teach these kids. Um, and you guys will have to school districts, maybe 50%. I mean, it's probably half and half, but I feel that the left side of the liberal agenda is always what's, you know, catered to. So maybe you should open your eyes to the people that um, don't live in fear, trust Jesus, and live our lives. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next speaker we have is Wayne Well, I'm pleased to be able to be here tonight, and I appreciate your service. I always uh, admire people who serve the community, and um, I am a registered nurse, and I've worked at Bonner General Hospital for a number of years. I am still working. I am semi-retired, but I still work, and I feel like I am attending work um, safely, working with patients. And I feel like I'm in a very safe environment. Um, as of yesterday, for 45,739 Bonner County residents, the percentage that the percentage that had COVID was 0.0015 percent, and as of yesterday, there were 72 active cases. Um, they're monitored by Panhandle Health, and um, I I have a grandchild that's 14 that lives with me, and I will say that he. 
we have maintained, you know, proper respect for the COVID virus, and yes, it is a virus, but I do feel that our bodies are quite resilient, and we should pay attention to those that are recovering, because there are a lot of cases that have recovered at home. The percentage that actually have to go to the intensive care unit is less than 3%. And usually they have some other underlying things. And uh, I can't go into statistics, but I've done a lot of research through different places that have the statistics. And there's a lot of things about ma mask etiquette. And masks can be good, but can, they can also be very detrimental. And um, I feel that we're going to have far worse things than COVID-19 for our children if they don't get back to school. And I feel that they need to in intermingle. Uh, I've seen children very depressed and very down on themselves. And um, they, 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 there's a lot of serious things out there that um, are in, and we all know that too, by having children stay at home and not being taught. But I, I feel like I'm in the medical community and um, I would, you know, I'm an older, you know, I've been a nurse for quite a while and I feel very safe at work. And I've been around a lot of teenagers um, and the children are intermingling anyways. And they're, they're very resilient. They have really good immune systems. And so I feel like the children need to come back to school. They need to uh, socialize and they need to be with their teachers. So um, anyways, thank you so much for your time. And thank you very I hope still get spoken. Are there any other members that are here that would like to speak that uh, did not sign up for this Okay. Thank you. We'll move on then to uh, action items we have. The first thing we have is um, COVID. In fact, it's the subject here that you're probably uh, here for. And that's COVID-19 school uh, re-entry plan. And I'll turn it over to the superintendent and give you all a pretty good idea what we're thinking about. All right, thank you, Carrie. Um, so uh, before I uh, go into our, our uh, draft plan, I do want to share with you uh, some results. And our current survey is still open uh, for individuals that have not taken it. Um, the previous survey in June, there were 650-ish individuals that have taken it. And at this time, we're up at 1,014. Uh, so much higher participation. Um, at this point in time, uh, trying to get some of the same data to help uh, decide what direction and where we're looking for from parents um, and with, with students in the district. So the first question here is, given that sanitization, social distancing, and safety measures are implemented, are you planning on sending your students to school on September 8th? And at this time, we are at uh, 67 almost 68%. So if you noticed in June, this was at 77, so it has dropped from 77 down to about 68, okay? Um, we were at about 2% that said no. We're up to about 12%, so that has increased. Um, and, and that was 124 uh, people, and they're still right around, it was 21% were undecided, and we're right about 20% undecided at this time. Um, so around 202 people had not decided. So um, for that information, just knowing where we are in our community at this time compared to when the very same exact question was given, these are the results for you to see. Um, the next question that was asked was um, about a blended learning. <coughs> Uh, so obviously we'll get to the plan and we'll be talking about the framework that was given to us by the State Board of Education uh, for reopening schools. And within that, um, there may be needed for blended learning. And the definition of blended learning, which was given in this survey, was a combination between face-to-face -face instruction and a combination of uh, potentially some online. So it, it's a combination of both. Um, and we put two options out there. One was, uh, would you want your students to attend school five days a week, even if it had to be a shortened schedule so that it could be blended between uh, some online, but 
having that contact with teachers five days a week, and that has come in at 55% of the respondents, 50, almost 56 if I round it up, and or attend a full, full day of schools twice a week, and that is at about 44. So um, you can see that uh, that's a, it's a little bit split, but there is uh, more people wanting kids at five days a week on, on this question. And the, the other question here was um, uh, providing a fully online option, uh, because as you see when I get to the plan, I truly believe in parental choice in um, having educational options. And one of those is uh, if, if we were to, and we are working on uh, providing a full online option with Idaho Digital Learning <coughs> um, for people who are just not feeling safe to send their kids to school. And at this point in time, um, there were 66, some 67 people, percent of the people said they would not be interested in a fully online option, and 33% uh, said that yes. Um, in hindsight, when you make a survey, you put a lot of thought into these questions. Um, I maybe would have put another option in there. So, I, I can tease out some information from these questions asked, but um, again, I just want to go on record to say I do appreciate the 1,014 parents that uh, are helping guide some decisions and giving us some uh, help in, in what this plan will be. So, um, and again, uh, that just is the most current survey at this point in time. So, we go into this, um, yeah. Question. One question. I'm going to ask a question. Is that all the respondents, did they respond to that, or is that, um, can we assume see. that that's more people that are? Four, four people skipped. Okay. So 1,010 people answered the question, four people skipped it. I got you. Thank good, you. good question. Yeah. Any other questions on the most current survey from the board? I don't know if this is really uh, we're, not, we're not taking any questions from the audience. Uh, this is just for the board. It's our meeting now. You're, you're welcome to be here, but it's not open to discussion. It's not a public meeting. So, but we certainly will be here after this. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. So let, let's just start through the draft. And I just want to say that this plan is designed to get school open and keep schools open. Okay? And um, it, it was already stated this evening that uh, you're not going to please everybody, and uh, I know that. But again, this plan is not a plan to try to close schools down, and um, it's not a plan to try to go to, uh, our goal is not to get to remote learning. Our plan is to get kids back in school. Um, with that, we need to do it safely, okay? And so uh, there's three priorities here, and that is the safety of students and staff. I uh, want to maximize the instructional time with a teacher using an Edel Health District guidelines. And so when we say maximize that, that is uh, uh, going to look depending upon what color we would be in. And uh, truly, it's important to provide educational choices to families. Um, I'm not going to say choose for a family what's best for them. That is their choice to choose. It is our job to try to provide as much menu as possible knowing that we can't provide a menu for every individual. So um, with that in mind, uh, we'll try to provide as many educational choices as possible. So <clears throat> um, what we're going to go over here is um, we took the framework and went four colors, not three colors, not um, the, the State Board of Education uh, put out for the uh, back to school framework, three colors. Um, so when we're looking at this plan, you can think of as orange and yellow, kind of in that minimal to moderate uh, community spread. Um, so, We'll start with the green plan, and for the, the ease of not trying to make this a monstrous document, everything that pertains in the green part will follow into the yellow, and so it kind of proceeds from there. But um, 
So, so let's start here. Um, green is a traditional five day a week school schedule as we would know it, um, as we've had. Um, this would be, according to the framework, no community spread, okay? Um, and I, I will uh, later on in the presentation um, give you the um, guideline that was given to you as a board from Panhandle Health to help guide that decision. Um, <coughs> obviously, safety, I said, safety of our students and our uh, staff are of utmost importance here. Um, we need to have a cleaning and disinfection plan approved by Panhandle Health District, and I can show you what that plan is here uh, in a little bit. Um, that's in another section. We encourage parents to screen students every morning before attending school and keep symptomatic students home. Um, this is another thing that um, if we, again, I want to reiterate, the goal here is to keep schools open. And I'm going to go over some things that we will, that if we can't do it, will be what would happen for us to close schools, and that's what we want to avoid. So um, we're really going to have to partner with parents. If your student is not feeling well, if we have staff that are not feeling well, and are symptomatic, we would need them to stay home. I mean, um, and, and it's important. The more that we can collaborate in that, the more that we can keep our schools open. Um, and I do have a link here. Um, and in this link, it is uh, basically going into symptoms, testing. It goes to the CDC website. <coughs> Provide learning options for families in the green. There will be face-to-face -face instruction um, with the following considerations. Maintain <coughs> social distancing as much as possible and reinforce hand washing and respiratory etiquette. Um, again, uh, proper hygiene. Um, some of the things that uh, are happening in the schools is we will have increased, um, every school is outfitted with um, water filling stations. So instead of a multiple touch water faucet, we would have a water filling station and uh, we would have every student bringing their own water bottle and drinking from their own water bottle. Uh, we would, uh, in, in the classroom, as much as we can, we'll maintain social distancing. Um, if we need to um, uh, have um, desks where we, we can spread them out, uh, we will do that if we have tables. Um, uh, we'll have some polycarbonate uh, plexiglass dividers that are see-through. I don't believe in putting kids in a box. I want the freedom of that in the education part. But um, if we um, need to put a safest environment so that we can keep schools open, um, we're, we are working on that. Um, face coverings are encouraged. Okay. Uh, limit. Avoid mixing of student groups to reduce potential exposures. Uh, that means we wouldn't put big assemblies in the gyms. We would not, um, uh, we will go in, when we go into yellow, we'll talk about what cohorting is um, and reducing the exposure that groups of students have with each other. But um, so limit and avoid mixing of student groups to reduce potential exposure. Um, and limit, avoid activities with large gatherings where social distancing cannot be maintained. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Also, um, as I mentioned, we are uh, partnering with Idaho Digital Learning Academy um, to provide a fully online option for those families and parents that just are not comfortable to send their kids to school. Um, I want to provide that opportunity. Idaho Digital Learning Academy, and um, there I'll, I'll just jump over here. Um, we will have a website here that will, and we will help guide uh, the families in registering for this. Idaho Digital Learning uh, Alliance has been around a long time. This is not new. This is something we've used in our secondary schools. Um, uh, Clark Fork has used it much differently than, say, Sanford High School or Sanford Middle School. Um, but what's new to Idaho Digital Learning Academy is an elementary school. Um, and they are just designing an elementary school that's going to be focusing on uh, English language arts and uh, math. And um, we will be guiding our families and giving them assistance and getting them um, registered for this if this is an option that they would choose. So um, as we go 
back again. Um, I believe in, in giving these options. Um, to keep our schools as um, clean as possible, um, staff will limit visitors and volunteers from non-school related persons. If we have volunteers that are in the classroom that are school related, we will continue as normal. But um, probably guest speakers, um, some of the extra things um, during this time uh, to try to be as safe as we can to keep our schools open would be somewhat limited. Um, and I want you to understand that this is a framework. Each building is going to have their own plan built off this framework. And we are a very unique and we are a very distinct school district. And what the, the plan that is at Clark Fork High School may be look different than the plan uh, at Sanborn High School. You, you've got potentially 1,000 students, potentially versus 120 students. It's a much different dynamic. What the Homeschool Academy could look like may be different than what Farm and Stidwell could look like. What uh, Hope Elementary could look like would be different than, say, Southside. So we're going to have to um, uh, design some building uh, plans um, to best manage the size and the number of students for safety here. So, um, so again, um, that, that will be coming from this framework. Um, sick or symptomatic staff and students uh, will not be allowed to school until the return to school status is met. Um, each site must have a plan in place to allow for immediate separation of students or staff who present COVID-19 symptoms um, at school. So we would have a, a health room and again, we would partner with parents and saying, okay, um, your student is showing some symptoms, we would uh, you know, need to have them um, you know, picked up from school. This is not much different than what we do when a student is sick now, but again, this is a, a sense that um, um, if we have students with symptoms, we really need parents to partner with us to keep our schools open. Um, distance learning plan will be available in the event that the student remains home from extended periods. So think about this, we are also bolstering up our learning management systems at both the secondary and the elementary schools. Learning management system um, at the secondary school, grade seven and up, is Schoology, and at the elementary level will be Google Classroom. Um, we know that um, students are best served in instructions with their teachers, okay? Um, a learning management system is a great tool, but it is not the end all be all. And it may be a great way to deliver information, but it is very difficult to deliver instruction. And so I, I don't want people to um, think that um, the learning management system is going to be the end all be all. It, it is an excellent tool. And if you are absent, you're showing symptoms, and or your family just chooses to keep you home, you can access all of that daily lesson from that learning management system. I have heard from a lot of parents that um, um, it is a big hardship on them for not to have schools open for multiple, multiple reasons. Not just because uh, we can go down the list that uh, they need to go to work, but they also don't feel that they have the ability to deliver the instruction, um, and uh, there are multiple reasons we could go through. So again, um, how do we, the, the question here to the group, and I know not everybody's gonna agree with me, is how can we keep our schools open? And I'm not the scientist, I'm not the person that's gonna uh, tell you the right theory. Um, this is one of the strangest times in society in, in my time of lifetime. Um, and, and it is when we're all in this together, and I guess that's when we're looking at these plans. How do we get our kids in school and how do we keep them in school? So, um, we will have signs posted in the schools, highly visible locations. Uh, we'll promote everyday protective measures, signs from the CDC. Um, you know, um, we will have uh, hand sanitization stations. 
Um, every elementary classroom has a sink. We don't have that luxury in the secondary schools, but in the sink, we've got hand washing. Uh, again, um, I, any, anybody is sitting in the audience or watching this could sit and say, Tom, I want to debate you on this or that. And I'll tell you, I can't debate you because I am not the expert in this. I am the expert in education and I want our kids in school. And we're going to try to do everything possible to keep our schools open. So, let's move on. That is our green plan. That is our regular schedule. Okay? That is if we had no community transmission. And we'll talk about the Panhandle Health uh, uh, protocol here in a little bit of what that really means. Modified traditional schedule, okay? This is, uh, I, I want everybody to know that a tremendous, tremendous amount of work has gone into this yellow plan. This yellow plan is keeping kids in school five days a week. How can we keep kids in school five days a week and reduce class sizes um, and make it so that it's more likely that we can keep our schools open? And so this is what we start with our first blended learning model. And in this blended learning model, we're going to start with elementary. And elementary means that we are going to cohort our students strongly. And let me define what cohort means. That means when a student is coming to school on the school bus or to the families, they are not going to go to the playground and mid or mix with uh, 500 other kids. They are going to go to their classroom, and let's say it's a second grade classroom, they will go to their second grade classroom, their second grade teacher will be there to meet them. We will have our lunch, or excuse me, our breakfast um, in the classroom. Um, we will have a sanitization program there. Um, we will um, have the lessons involved there. Um, at the elementary level, um, we feel that um, masks would be um, expected on the bus and in the hallway. Once they get to their classroom, it's encouraged. I want families to have the right that if they feel that they want their students to wear a mask in an elementary classroom and we are strongly cohorting, I want them, those students to feel like they can wear a mask there. If it, so it is encouraged, and that is the language that's written in this plan. Um, I agree it is very difficult for an elementary student and uh, for us to be completely masked up the full time. Okay? Um, but I want that option for both families there. But getting there to protect our staff and our students um, I think we need to take as many safety precautions as possible. Um, so the words are, masks are expected on the bus and expected in the hallway to your class, and then they would be encouraged at that point in time. But then uh, recess would be with that first, second grade class, whatever cohort it would be, um, um, and they would be limited to only that group of students, that cohort of students, and what other teacher or specialist that would be working with that group. Um, we feel that if we can strongly cohort, then we do not need to shut schools down. Um, but if we get a positive case that is tested, and this is later in the plan, I'm jumping ahead, but if we were to get a positive case in a sixth grade classroom and um, that all the sixth grade students are, are going to be in close contact with the positive case, then that sixth grade classroom might have to go to remote learning with that teacher, but we don't have to shut the whole school down. Um, and uh, so our goal, again, is everything is designed to keep the schools open, but we cannot ignore um, our CDC guidelines and the guidance we're getting from the medical professionals when we do get a positive case. I don't want positive cases and I hope we don't have to deal with that and we keep our schools open. But what I'm saying is, is what, if by cohorting we don't have to shut the whole school down, we could shut down maybe just one classroom, do some deep cleaning. If it's widespread, we may have to shut the school down for a day for deep cleaning and then reconvene. 
okay? Um, that is at the elementary level. Secondary level, it is extremely hard for us to cohort students. They take many different subjects. Um, so at the secondary level, uh, the modif modified schedule allows to utilize staff um, and reduces class size. In this yellow plan and uh, in the parent survey, school day is reduced and it would be approximately from 8 to 1 to 1240, 1245, it all depends on busing. And let me explain why. Um, teachers teach and have a period off that is called a prep period. At some of the larger schools, if we have all teachers teaching every period and not have anybody taking a prep period during that period one, two, three, and four, and move all their prep periods to the end of the day, then we have, for example, instead of 45, I'll, I'll use Sample in High School as an example, instead of having 45 sections for kids to go to, there would be 58. Therefore, the class size would be reduced because there would be fewer kids in the class, which would be easier to social distance. Um, so at the secondary level, um, we need to reduce those class sizes and push that prep period. Also, on any given day, we know there's going to be students who are absent. Um, we're, uh, this is a big paradigm shift for us. Um, going to be a big paradigm shift for us because how many years have we done uh, perfect attendance awards? Okay, We've emphasized uh, rewarding kids for being at school every day and not missing a day. Um, but in this case, we are encouraging uh, students to not come to school if they're not feeling well. I mean, um, because that would allow us to keep our schools open. And, and again, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, with the, the minimum uh, state standards here, um, here, here is a link to a few schedules. Um, and again, this is not completely broken out here. Let me make this a little larger. So, for example, Clark Fork High School, LPO, and Sandpoint High School, um, 8 to 8.30 students would be, uh, come. We would have a little bit later start. Um, first period teachers available in their classrooms. Students would go, um, they, if they need breakfast, they could go get their sack breakfast, and then they would go into the classroom. Face-to-face um, -face instruction um, is from 8.30 to 12.45. They would have four classes, just like they normally would. They would be shortened. Um, and then that dismissal would be somewhere around, it's a draft, somewhere around 1245. Sandpoint Middle School, very similar at the elementary level. 820 to 1 o'clock is instruction with only the homeroom teacher and lunch um, included in there. Students would be exiting the building between 1 and 110. Um, and what we need to understand is teachers are going to have to manage both face-to-face -face instruction and they're also going to have to manage their learning management system for the students who are not there and keep up with that. And we are doing extensive training um, on putting some minimum requirements on our Schoology and our Google Classroom. Okay, um, I know people, um, I can go back to the survey of what happened from March to May. Some, there are very few people that had a wonderful experience with that. For the most part, we need to step up and do a better job with our learning management system and connecting and using that. Um, and we are prepared to do that. Um, but we, we know is at any given time um, that there may be a certain percent of students whose parents are choosing to keep them home, not do the fully online. I'm going face to face. I know their school five days a week but I want to keep the schools open. I may keep my kids home um, this week 
and we're going to look at things on learning manage the learning management system, and we're, I'm able to do that, um, or they're just not feeling well. And I know it's a hardship, but again, this is going to work if we all can go together here to keep our schools open. If, for example, they may have to go to their grandparents, may have to go to a neighbor's, um, or, or maybe parents work, don't work on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and they choose to do that learning management there to limit that exposure. Uh, that's a parental choice. It always is. And so what I want, what I like about the yellow plan is the flexibility. <clears throat> Along with this is only about four hours of instruction a day. That's some flexing there. So the older the grades are, the more online learning would also have to be required. So for example, um, at uh, Clark Fork High School, there would be 30 minutes of class if it's a four period schedule, 40 minutes if it's a three period schedule, that would be expected for distance learning and 30 minutes at Sandpoint High School. Now, I can assure parents who get nervous about this is that we will be talking to our staff. Um, sometimes you have homework anyway. This will not be in addition to your homework. We will uh, try to blend those two because we know that's a big commitment for families. You're working all day, you come home, now you got this big load too. We understand that and we want to partner and work with you on that. Um, if it comes down to first through third grade, it may just be an additional 10 minutes per day um, that we have to put in there to meet our minimum requirement. But that's usually what we have is we want parents reading with students anyway, um, doing some math facts, um, and that would be sent. Uh, kindergarten really would not have to do anything additional there. Uh, fourth through sixth grade would be about 40 minutes a day um, in addition to the face-to-face -face instruction they would get. So that is the yellow plan. That is the plan that gives us the most flexibility. Uh, <coughs> I think gives us the most parental choice and also puts procedures in place to keep us as um, safe as possible. Um, and, um, you know, I, I do want to say at the secondary level, um, yeah, face coverings are going to be necessary in, in order for us to try to uh, keep schools um, um, safe. Orange. We put orange in here, and if you want to read throughout the state and you look at a lot of models that different districts are doing in different states, a lot of um, them are doing this AP schedule where they get to go to school two days a week and then the second half gets to go two days a week. I feel that we put this in here in case we get in that situation, um, that to have that flexibility, um, the more I think about it, the more I think we can be flexible in the yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and um, would be hard pressed to go to two days a week if uh, we get um, severe transmission within the community. Um, you know, we may, we could go from yellow to red, but before we do that, we would try to explore that option of at least maximizing the contact that students have with their teachers. And that is really, really the goal. Um, and uh, again, red would be full distance learning. This is what we want to avoid. Um, we are not, um, we have not put a whole lot of time into this other than um, it'll be the same learning management system that we are training on up here in yellow. Um, we put our time in we want our kids back in school. We want them in front of our teachers. And um, this, is, this is where we feel it, it's best. So those, those are the four colors. Um, confirmed cases, okay. If we get a confirmed case in school, um, uh, we, we need to have a protocol here. And we need to be able to communicate this out to the families. Um, we would ask that if a student or staff member tests positive for COVID-19, to please notify the district as soon as possible. Um, we thank you in advance for this communication. Um, we're not going to, um, and again, I'll, I'll be careful here. Um, we're going to treat it as business as usual. Um, we're not going to hit a panic button. Um, 
but we're going to be as safe as possible. Uh, the building may close for one to three days for additional cleaning, depending upon that, and we say may, um, remote learning for those students. The district will work closely with Panhandle Health to communicate uh, potential exposure, close contact, and we've got a definition of what that is down below. Um, elementary students, as I mentioned already, if there's a positive case, the entire class um, Cohort will go to distance learning model until the procedure below has been followed. Exceptions may occur. Okay. Um, secondary, if a, but I didn't say the whole school, it would be a class. Secondary, if a positive case occurs, safety measures such as face coverings and social distancing should prevent the need to quarantine each class a student was in. And that's our goal is. Um, uh, if we have a positive case, um, we don't want to tell every student that that student had been in that class If we can put the safety measures in place. We don't want to have to quarantine or have them quarantine. Uh, and uh, if another student had close contact with that individual in or outside of school setting, that student should also be quarantined until the procedures below have been followed. And the definition of close contact is any individual who is within six feet for at least 15 minutes starting from two days before illness onset. Okay, that, that is the guidelines that we are given. Um, so people say, what's the magic number of six feet? I'm not the scientist. I'm not telling you. It's the guideline we have. <laughs> it seems reasonable. Um, and I think uh, I, I look at it as a way to keep schools open. Um, the, I, and I can't tell you the science behind the 15 minutes, just that the longer you're around a person who is positive, um, the more likely that you're probably going to uh, could, could contract that. Um, procedures. Students and staff in close contact should self-isolate at home 14 days from the last contact. If symptoms appear, please contact your health care provider. Um, and we would communicate this. Uh, we just got this guideline here on Friday. The student or staff member who tested positive may return to school or work when all of the following criteria are met. Minimum of 10 days have passed since a positive test date. Minimum of 10 days since symptoms appeared. Symptoms are improving and no fever for at least 24 hours without fever reducing medication. So within this, it, it's a little confusing. Why do you have the 14 day quarantine that seems to counter uh, the 10 days, but I believe that before you're even going to be notified uh, that you tested positive, there probably was uh, three, four, five days have gone by, which then would, um, you know, be connected in there. Um, you know, I don't know that you necessarily need this, but um, there is also a guideline to help us with the decision tree. Um, and I know that it's extremely small, but it's basically what I just said. Um, it's one of, it's a flow chart, yes or no, um, telling health guide families what to do. So kind of to recap what I said, what all of us can do to help keep schools open, which is our goal, is reduce a positive, reduce positive cases or clusters by ensuring physical distancing strategies are in place. Reduce a positive case or cluster by following district's face covering protocols. Uh, clean, disinfecting appropriately, washing or sanitizing our hands frequently, limiting the mixing of students, and sick staff or students should stay home when symptomatic or test positive. Um, in this plan, this will be where we will have further building safety protocols, nothing to go over there. Um, this is some further information on the plan. The first is the guidance that um, you as a school board, and uh, levels of community spread for the Idaho back to school framework. So. Uh, basically, this is defining where we have uh, category one. Notice that K 
category two is minimal to moderate. That is both our yellow and our orange. And then category three is substantial community transmission. Um, I don't need to read this to you, uh, but this is a guide here for the school board um, that was delivered from uh, Idaho Health and Welfare. And uh, it does go down and describe minimal to moderate community spread. Um, it defines no community transmission and um, it is a substantial community transmission. So it, it does give some guides there that, that you can read, read through there. Um, the rest of the plan here, this has our, our maintenance uh, cleaning protocols um, of everything that we will uh, be cleaning. And I, I do want you to know that, um, you know, we're very sensitive. We, we, we have our, our cleaners that, um, uh, are set up for COVID-19 that we use, but we've also researched and found um, with kids eating lunch in the classroom, that is a concern of mine. We have also found a uh, new product that um, can be used in cleaning those tables um, that is not as, uh, say, what the, as potent as the uh, night custodians would use. We, we want to be uh, safe for that. It is food safe. It is. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Um, food service, working with them. This is a mind shift change for everybody. Okay, the idea of, okay, I get to serve this type of lunch and this and that, and all the kids are sitting in the cafeteria. Okay, um, it, it's going to be a little different. Um, and, and, and until things subside, um, we're all in this. And uh, uh, believe me, this is on our directors, our directors of food service, our director of maintenance, our directors of transportation. Uh, this is a difficult thing on every one of them to look at their practices, and it's not okay to say, uh, well, we're just going to do what we always do. No, we're not. We're going to make it as safe as possible, and um, everybody has been wonderful in um, stepping up in uh, cooperating in that. So food service. Uh, you know, transportation, uh, a few things we have here. Social distancing will occur when practical. Facial coverings expected for drivers and students. Hand sanitizers will be placed on the bus. The bus will be loaded from the back uh, of the bus forward. Families would sit together. Buses would be sanitized twice a day. Um, and windows down, ventilation when weather permits. So those are some of the precautions we have there. Um, within technology, um, if need be, the availability of Chromebooks here um, from uh, second through sixth grade, we would be able to send a Chromebook home with every student. Um, that is not what I want to do because that means we're in red. And again, this whole plan was built around not closing schools, but keeping schools open. Um, but if we want to be prepared there, um, we do not um, at this time have full class sets for kindergarten and first grade. Um, I'm not so sure uh, that that is that significant at this time. Um, and um, obviously we've got Chromebooks for 7 through 12 and then uh, we would have some cleaning uh, procedures there. One, and also still partnering with the Idaho Business for Education. Um, one of the biggest obstacles we do have in our community is um, the connectivity from the survey that came out in June. There's about 28% of our families said they did not have adequate connectivity. And when I say we can put the best lessons in place, we can have all these videos that you have to stream, but if you do not have adequate connectivity, that does not help you. So again, we need to be very sensitive to that. One more reason that I will say, and you're tired of hearing me say, we want to keep schools open, and we all have to work together to try to make that happen. Um, but the Idaho Business for Education is important, or it is important to them to uh, try to um, help with that connectivity issue that we have in our community. Um, Senator Jim Woodward at the last school board meeting did speak. He is on the Digital Divide Committee, and they are looking at those options. But as we know, in rural North Idaho, um, those, those solutions could take a long time and, um, you know, it's not something that's going to be real uh, quick. Um, extracurricular activities, uh, the last thing here in this plan, um, we are still working on a separate plan from that. 
some guidelines came out from the Idaho High School Activities Association of how to safely do activities, and that is still a work in progress, and that plan would come to you in a, in a further meeting. So, uh, I know I've taken a long time here. Um, at this point in time, I would entertain questions from the board. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, questions from the board? Um, concerns? Um, one of my uh, concerns at our last meeting, and I'm not sure if this is yet the right time, but from the teacher's standpoint, are there a certain number of teachers who consider themselves vulnerable and would not be ready to go to face-to-face? -to -face? Right. We will follow federal guidelines on that. Um, obviously, we will um, follow the American Disability Act of uh, what would qualify a staff member to truly um, be in a position that they could not. Um, but, uh, so uh, absolutely we will accommodate within what we can do. We do not know how many. I mean, we could have staff members undergoing chemotherapy, we could have staff members you know, yeah. the, the doctors are we're not recommending this or that. Those will be ones that we will um, follow the um, American Disability yeah. Act and the CARES Act. And so at the building level, those it, administrators will get a few right. of those numbers. We, yeah, so at this point in time, um, I am working with the Teachers Association on that, but at this point in time, we do not have a list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, other comments? Uh, yes. I'd like to say I, I think I agree with everybody in this room that we want kids in school. But only if I also agree with the protocol that only if we can do it safely and securely. And I want to applaud Tom and the staff for doing a terrific job yeah. here. Here, here. The plan. Um, I, I do have some questions, though, a number of questions. Yeah. Um, mostly about um, the protocol for um, students that become infected or are suspected to be infected. You know, if a student comes to school and, and he meets the criteria that he should have a test, you know, how, how does he get a test? And, 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 and how do we find out what the test results are? So there, there's a lot of uh, protected information of students through their HIPAA medical records and FERPA, and we need to follow closely those privacy acts. Um, to be honest with you, Gary, I really believe that it's the, our duty, if the student is not feeling well, to contact the parents, but the parents then take that um, responsibility um, on to themselves. We will not be a testing center, and we will not test students at school. So if we, if we identify a student as a candidate for a test, we can't, we can't administer the test, and we can't. It's not our role. Our role is how can, we, how, can, how can we be certain that a student is get, getting tested? Well, and again, Gary, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a scientist and know everything. And uh, depends on what news channel you watch and whatever you get here and there. But I'm just saying is that um, we have people who are asymptomatic, um, and then we have the only thing we know is students that are, are symptomatic. Well, yeah, um, what so we know, great, is, is that the students, students, students can get infected and can be carriers of this disease, but right. frequently, frequently young children, you know, are asymptomatic or have very minor symptoms. Um, but, yeah. but in, in, in our, you know, recover and themselves very well, but, but they're carriers, you know, and they can infect staff and they can infect, right. you know, older, Why? older family members at home. And, and, and that's again to be a parental option there. I we will have our staff members required to be uh, in face coverings um, and uh, social distance, um, you know, the best they can. I mean, like I said, it's, it, tonight's not a debate on um, research on whether they're 10 years or younger. Um, they're going to be less likely to spread the the. Um, you know, you can read that article. Uh, so our teenagers more likely, so it's more, you know, I want to protect our staff out of precaution, not out of a belief. Um, I just want to, 
I want to keep schools open. The, the yo-yo of having to close schools and open schools and close schools, I, I want to avoid that like anything that I, I, you can I, believe yeah. today. I just think that's something we might be facing, and I, I the more precautions, and I'm going to say, any precaution we put in here that anybody might be concerned about is out of, sincerely, not a belief, not us as a school district taking a stance on anything, but it is truly to keep our schools open. So, so we don't have any way of, of, of ensuring that a student who you know, needs to be tested is getting tested. Well, the best thing, Gary, always, I've always found is to partner with the parents and have that communication with the parents. Um, and we have to be in this together. Mm -hmm. I mean, we truly do. And I, I don't want um, this to be anything different than that. Well, what are we going to do about contact tracing? So suppose a family member tests positive. You know, and there's, and there's another family member who's attending school. What I've been told by the head epidemiologist is, at Panadol Health is if there's a family member that's positive, that individual would be a contact, but any contact to a contact would not have to quarantine. Um, and so that has been specifically told to me in a conversation. So. If, if that, I would rely on that family again, Gary, that I, I can't, all I can do is, uh, is put a warm welcome out to the families to partner with us on this so that we can keep our schools open. But that family member tests positive, um, and we've had some situations this summer with some summer activities where the families did just that. They um, self-quarantined for 14 days, removed themselves from the activity because they had a family member test positive. <laughs> And um, it, there was never, it wasn't an issue. That was on a much smaller scale than opening school, I understand that. And I do really appreciate the, those families taking that upon themselves. And I really think um, that's what we have to ask, is not to, uh, I, I, yeah. yeah, and I can't say it any, so any I think, I think that your point, you said, Tom, is that I'm not a scientist, I'm not a medical profession, we're just educators, and I think that that that's the right balance. I didn't there. say just. Not just. <laughs> you are uh, exceptional <laughs> educators. Uh, so I think it's how many experts in education. Experts in education. Right. So, uh, okay, let me, I'd like to make a few comments. First of all, I'd like to <coughs> thank uh, Tom and the staff uh, for putting this plan together. Yeah. As you can see, it's quite extensive. And I'd just like to say, this is going to be a guideline. There are going to be changes to this probably before school even starts uh, if we do it. So we need to be flexible. We need to realize it's just a, it's guidelines. And we need to realize we need to work together. The staff and the parents and everybody to make this thing work. And again, I'll reiterate what, what the Tom said. Our whole goal is to keep the kids in school, keep the schools open. Keep them in there, getting as much face-to-face -face training as we possibly can. So that's the goal. So, any other comments we have before we move on? We have uh, more on the agenda today, so I don't want to keep everybody too late. So, What's our goal today with this with this draft document? Is it to uh, make a motion to approve or to? Okay. Allowed to go to final. Because it's a working document and there are sections that are not filled, it would be, I think, administrations asked to table until the next meeting. Okay. It's, yeah. it's your choice if you're comfortable with. Well, I mean, it's a working. Well, we don't need to adopt the framework if you yes. would like to I think say. we need to say we have a consensus that this is a good framework and the next meeting you bring a final draft. Yeah, I feel very strongly that, okay? that this is great work. Um, okay. Is that satisfactory with yeah. the rest of the board? Uh, so we I don't need a motion, I'll, I'll, I'll take them up with Tom. Okay. Yeah. And we can refine it. It's a, it's a, like you said, it's a document in progress and will be refined. This is a, and, and this way, too, we will. At least we've never uh, been before. That's true. This way, there will be uh, more information on the papers and things like this. So uh, the public will have a comment. Have uh, availability to comment on it, and uh, so we can find through the whole thing. Okay. Okay. okay.
In that case, uh, we'll move on to uh, the board. We have some. Carrie, I do ask that if you're not going to make a motion to adopt, that you do make a motion to table, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion that we table the uh, COVID-19 school reentry plan for 2021 until our next meeting. Second that. Uh, to move to second, that we table the plan as we've just been discussing until our next meeting. Uh, any further discussion? If I could just interject, yes, um, given the time sensitivity and my promise to parents that um, I would one month before school um, give them a uh, the policy, uh, I'm a little concerned, um, but I can present them uh, this. If you're, it doesn't, I don't believe it would take a motion, but I would still present this to all families as a draft policy. Um, and the framework that we're using, but we're still working on that. So I just don't want the board to be surprised if uh, I communicate this to the family after I clean it up a little bit because uh, I think it's important. I have a lot of families asking about what their options are, and I feel that it's important that we get that out to the families. They, they are very um, uh, concerned about what their uh, education is going to look like for their kids. And, really want to wait till August, I think, 11. I, I told them uh, I would get it out to them in the first week of August. So. I'm comfortable with that. I, I think you can consider I think uh, you can say it's a working document, and here's what we have, and the board has this consensus, but it's not a finalized. And it's document. also a good idea that people can look at this and know that, hey, we can still have some input if there's something they have questions right. about. Or It will be adopted in, sure. in August so that they know they have a chance to get a hold of us and give them that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. The motion uh, is on, on the table. All of the favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. That motion is carried. Thank you. Okay. Next we have the second reading of various policies that we have. Um, thank you. At the last board meeting, we did go over all of the first reading of these policies. Being that this is second reading, I would just ask again if you had any questions or concerns about what was presented at last time. If not, there is a proposed motion to adopt these revised and new policies. Okay. Uh, can we adopt them all at once? Or do you yeah, the motion includes them. Okay. Are you guys comfortable? Yeah. In that case, I'll entertain a motion to adopt. So I move to adopt revisions to policies 1120, policy 3000, policy 3280, policy 3295, and adopt new policies 3010 and 3080 as presented. I'll second that. It's been moved and second that we approve the revised policies and also the new ones are stated in the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. And that's adopted. Next, we have the consent agenda. I will make a motion that we approve consent agenda. Second. We move to second, we approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 That motion carries. Next, we have information and announcements. And uh, we'll start with our superintendent. Do you have any more? I think you heard from me enough today. So I would uh, nothing coming right now except okay. for this plan today. Okay. Well, do you have any announcements? Today? I will say that I was able to find somebody to fill my tech ed position, and he has 15 years of experience in engineering, and I'm hoping that he. he really excited and so I'm excited to have him on my staff because uh, he started on the ground floor with a company clear up to full on head engineer and so he has a lot to offer the kids that are hard for so I'm really excited to have a new staff member. Sweet. Yeah. Good. 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 Nothing tonight, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I had a new family orientation 
uh, two weeks ago now, and I have 27 students on a wait list to get into school. Oh, good. So as soon as we get all this ironed out, I can figure out who I can open it up to. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, David. I see you back there. That's all right. Not, nothing tonight. Thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I change my mic? You can change your mic. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure with everything going on and uh, with the school closure that you have formally have been introduced to Jackie Crossingham. Jackie, if you could stand up. Jackie um, is going to be the new principal at uh, Northside Elementary School, um, and uh, she is coming to Northside Elementary uh, from Sandpoint Middle School. So uh, welcome, Jackie, and we're really excited for her to uh, take the lead role at Northside Elementary. Great, welcome. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, do you have any words of wisdom for us? <laughs> I am just excited to have a plan to work with and moving forward. I have been to Northside, but I haven't been there with children. So I want to see the children there, so I'm super excited to move forward with that. So very, very pleased with this one. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next item we have will is to go to the executive chefs and we'll have a short recess before we do that. But we'll, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. I would make a motion that we go into executive session as provided for in Idaho Code Title 74, Section 206, Subsection 1B, to consider the evaluation, dismissal, or disciplining of or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent, or public school student. Second. Uh, so we'll the second, we go to executive session, and the state is a uh, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Trustee Williams. Aye. Trustee Supiker. Aye. Trustee Decker. Aye. Trustee Lewis. Aye. Chair Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the session. We'll take a short recess as we go down. If any of you have any questions, you know, we're certainly welcome to chat on the right. Chat on the right. Yeah. <laughs>